Bitcoin is doing something it never does for long. Volatility has collapsed again, prices stuck below every major structural level, and yet the data is quietly flashing an early bullish expansion. That combination doesn't resolve sideways, it resolves violently. So in this video, I'll show you why the market is being pulled towards a critical level, how this setup could complete a textbook bear market, or completely break the four-year cycle, and why, whichever way it goes, is likely to catch most people offside. So let's get into it. After our descent from the all-time highs to round off 2025, Bitcoin has now settled into what I would only describe as a very clear consolidation range. Price has gone quiet again, and volatility has compressed. And interestingly, it's compressed back down to levels that, historically speaking, don't tend to stick around for very long. This is usually the part of the cycle where people get bored, and where conviction gets tested, and then the narrative starts to fracture. But from a data perspective, this is where things actually start to get interesting. So let's start with volatility, because this is always the precursor to every major move Bitcoin has ever made. And what you're looking at here is the volatility waves indicator. And this measures Bitcoin's vol using a seven-day logarithmic return calculation. Or in simple terms, it's quantifying the intensity of price fluctuations over a short rolling window, but doing it in a way that properly accounts for percentage-based price moves rather than raw dollar changes. And that matters because a $1,000 swing at $20,000 carries far more market weight than the same swing at $100,000. And right now, the volatility waves is sitting at 43. And any time we drop into the low 40s or even the 30s, historically, it doesn't stay there for long. These are the levels that represent compressed volatility. And this, in Bitcoin, is not a stable state. It's a spring that's being loaded. And eventually, that energy has to be released. And when it does, it releases violently, either to the upside or to the downside. So the real question is not, will volatility expand? Because it will. The real question is, which direction will that expansion resolve in? And that's where we bring in the next indicator. This is the volatility directional bias, or the VDB. And the purpose of this indicator is very specific. It measures the imbalance between upside volatility and downside volatility in Bitcoin's price. Or in other words, it's not just telling us that vol exists, but whether bullish vol or bearish vol is dominating beneath the surface. And what it does is it gives us directional context. It helps us identify whether we're in a true consolidation phase, whether there's upward pressure building, or whether downside pressure is quietly taking control before the price actually reflects it. And this signal is still relatively powerful when the price is flat, like it is now. And right now, the VDB is signaling what appears to be the early stages of a bullish expansion phase. Now, I want to be very clear here. This can change quickly. Vol signals are not static, they're reactive by nature. But historically, when this indicator flips and holds, it tends to remain consistent for at least a month or two before we see any sort of meaningful mean reversion. And at the moment, it's not showing signs of a false breakout, it's not chopping back and forth, and it does seem to be trending with intent. And that doesn't mean it's guaranteed upside, but it does mean that, probabilistically, the next vol expansion is currently biased towards the upside rather than the downside. Now, that's the short-term vol picture, but volatility alone doesn't give us the regime context. For that, we need to look at where we are and where price sits relative to the most important structural levels in the market. And for me, there are three pricing levels that matter more than anything else right now. The first is the short-term holder realized price. The second is the 365-day moving average. And the third is the 200-day moving average. So let's break those down briefly. Now, the short-term holder realized price represents the average on-chain cost basis of coins held by investors who acquired their Bitcoin within the past five to six months. And these are the participants that are most sensitive to price fluctuations. And when price is above their realized price, they're generally in profit and more willing to hold. And when price is below it, they're underwater on average and selling pressure increases. Therefore, it serves as this kind of excellent line in the sand that separates the bulls from the bears. And right now, the short-term holder realized price is sat at $99,000. So we need to respect the local bearish regime until we convincingly break above it. Now, the 365-day moving average, which smooths out an entire year of price action, is sitting at around $101,000. 
And this is another excellent bull versus bear sentiment divider. And finally, the 200-day moving average, which is arguably the most widely watched trend filter in all of financial markets, is sitting at approximately $106,000. Now, what's important here is not just the individual values, but the fact they're all converging around the same region, roughly speaking, the $100,000 level. And this, for me, is the ultimate line in the sand. Not only do we have the convergence of three of the most important structural averages in the Bitcoin market, but we also have the psychological significance of a major round number. And markets care about round numbers. Traders care about round numbers. Liquidity clusters around numbers, whether we think it's ridiculous or not. So when you combine the structural, behavioural and psychological factors together, that 100k region becomes absolutely critical over the next few months. Now, my framework is very simple here. Anytime Bitcoin is trading below all three of these levels, I consider the market to be in a bearish regime. Even if we have bullish short-term signals, and even if the momentum looks constructive, until those levels are reclaimed and held, the risk of further downside remains very real. And we don't have to speculate wildly to see why. The last time Bitcoin was trading below all three of these key pricing levels was December of 2021. And what happened then is pretty telling. We dropped hard, then rally back up to those levels. And it looked like, to many people, like a recovery. But price failed to reclaim them as support. Instead, it rejected cleanly as a perfect resistance, rolled over, and entered a deep extended bear market. And that exact pattern is a very realistic possibility right now. We could absolutely see a rally towards $100,000 over the coming months, driven by volatility expansion and bullish short-term price dynamics only for price to then fail at those levels and then roll back over into a prolonged bear market. And this is well within historical precedent, which is why it's so important not to get emotionally anchored to only one outcome. Instead, we've got to quantify the risk. And to do that, we turn to one of my favourite indicators, the Z-score probability waves. And this indicator gives us a statistically grounded framework for understanding price deviation extremes relative to a smooth mean or just in plain English, it answers a very simple but powerful question. How statistically extreme is the current price relative to its historical behaviour? It does this by mapping price onto standard deviation bands, or sigma levels, relative to the long-term trend. And if I was stuck with having to pick three indicators to live off for the rest of my life, this would definitely be one of them. And if you want to see every chart that I use updated in real time, then go check them all out on onchainmind.io which is my brand new charting platform. Now, right now, Bitcoin is sitting firmly between neutral and the minus one sigma level. And that tells me one clear thing, that price is not statistically overheated. We're nowhere near any type of overheated territory, either to the upside or to the downside. And interestingly, the current directional bias of the Z-score is back towards neutral, which once again lines up perfectly with that 100k region. So everything seems to be converging there. But let's talk about the downside risk, because that's what most people are either underestimating or just emotionally avoiding. Now, if this move turns out to be a continuation of a broader bearish trend, and if history rhymes even loosely, then the Z-score framework suggests that the maximum downside risk from here is around $75,000 over the next few months. And that's a dynamic level, meaning it updates in real time. So unless we see a near vertical drop from here, the actual bottom would more likely land somewhere between sixty-five dollars to $70,000 after some extended consolidation. And that would represent a full statistical washout, or maximum market pessimism, which would almost certainly align with broader macro fear. So when you put this all together, the way I see it, there are two dominant scenarios that could play out over the near term for me. The first scenario is that we rally over the next few months towards $100,000, driven by this fall expansion and the improving short-term momentum, and then fail at the key pricing levels, reject it as resistance, and then drop back down into the $70,000 region to finish off a classic bear market structure into the latter half of 2026. And the second scenario here is that we rally to $100,000, consolidate, reclaim those key pricing levels as support, and then continue the broader uptrend, supported by a positive macro environment, of liquidity and institutional flows. And in this scenario, the four-year cycle narrative that some are emotionally anchored to 
would have been officially nailed dead. And this would signal that Bitcoin has matured beyond self-fulfilling prophecies and has evolved into a sort of macro liquidity sponge driven by institutional flows and global debasement rather than an asset that's fixated around revolutions around the sun. Sorry if that offended any four-year cycle bros. Now, what might surprise you is that I'm genuinely comfortable with both outcomes. If the first scenario plays out, then we have a very predictable, very tradable bear market structure unfolding in real time, just like the classic bears of the past. We can use the bear market rallies into resistance to trade and manage risk, deploy capital strategically, and ultimately go all in near the statistical floor marked by the Z-score. And that's not scary to me. That's opportunity all the way down to the bottom. And if the second scenario plays out, then something even more interesting happens, where the entire traditional FOIA cycle narrative gets thrown out the window. And yes, that would confuse people, and it will cause hesitation, and will definitely break expectations. But structurally, it would be a very bullish signal. And personally, I've been accumulating in the $80,000 region, specifically because I don't want to get caught underexposed to scenario two if the classic cycle playbook fails. One of the worst feelings in financial markets is feeling clever and exiting a position fully only to watch the market rally and leave you behind. And if we continue to ride a positive macro environment into this year, new all-time highs are absolutely on the table and probably a lot sooner than most people think. So from my perspective, this is one of those setups where there's asymmetry to both sides of the market and it all depends on how you view the macro outlook in this year, nothing else. Either we get a clean, predictable bear market structure that offers textbook trading and accumulation opportunities, or we get a continuation into new all-time highs that rewards those patient investors who have positioned themselves into the recent price weakness. Either way, I'm comfortable, and either way, the data gives us a framework so that we're not guessing whichever way the market goes. So I'll leave it with you. What do you guys think? If we reclaim $100,000, are you positioned for a continuation or are you still treating this as the final resistance in a bear market rally? Anyway, thank you all for watching and I'll catch you all in the next one.